Connors tea. How are ye lot? We're candle of tales and we're gonna light a candle and tell a tale. So let's light her up. I'm Sarika and I'm here with my brother Aaron. And I'm Aaron. We're candle of tales. Yes, we are. Uh, so we have of late told some longer stories. We have, yeah. We've shied on for ages. I mean, we we are usually at high risk of shying on for ages. It's it's true. It's, it's it's kind of the baseline. Comes with the gift of the gab. I mean, it it comes with the territory, I guess. But also, you know, we we quite like the sound of our own voices a little bit, don't we? Hashtag we're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that was a creak from the creaky stool. Sorry, got the creaky stool. Yeah. We're once more in the office and we're recording a podcast. This is our fourth podcast. We yeah. decided to uh you know, keep the keep you guys getting us giving us giving us getting us getting us feedback. Giving us feedback. <laughs> I forgot how to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, getting us feedback about our live show release and uh our live telling of a story. She's laughing at me because I'm not making sense. We You're recorded. Really not. We recorded a few shows basically, and we released them as podcasts. Oh. As our first and second one. I follow you now. I'm yes. Glad that you follow me because then the person who's now listening to me definitely is following me. Eventually, you probably wouldn't have if I tried to make that. that oh God! Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even gotten the story yet but we're here all night <laughs> what he's trying to say is we started this with a live show and that was fine right, and sure. then we also did a, a studio recorded story ah uh, yeah that's what and, and we're going to continue with that for a little while but we'd really like to hear from you guys which you preferred and uh, we're also going to do stories of different lengths yeah. and that's that's you know partly to mix it up but also partly because those stories are different lengths. Some mm. of them are extremely long, uh, like last week's one, which I actually condensed a reasonable amount. You left out the whole the chat up line between Deirdre and I and did. Nisha. Oh God, the greatest chat up line of all time. I couldn't believe you left that out. Do you know what? We're going to put it in another podcast. Because <laughs> Irish Irish mythology chat up lines is like a whole subgenre that is just oh. It's hilarious. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Lots of comparisons to cows in a complimentary way. Um, so Turns out that's changed. This, this story. <laughs> I tried it out once. Didn't go well. I can no. imagine it, it did not go well. Uh, this story is a little bit shorter. It is, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit, shall we say, punchier. Hmm. And I suppose it's one of the you know, you could keep on saying every single story we tell is the first story of the town. But this is one of the original Genesis stories. Yeah, I mean, you could you could kind of start the town anywhere, but it is definitely one of the, the rave scales of the of, of the town or the pre scale One of the stories that it kind of surrounds it and supports it. So if you haven't listened to the first two podcasts, you might want to go back and check them out. Do. Uh, you don't have to, because this is a self-contained story. We refer to the curse of Maka in this, and this is what this story explains yeah. and tells you about. And if you want to hear more about this Patreon page. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, you can find more about us and more about what we're doing on, on the Patreon page. You can become a patron on Patreon. That's how you do that. That's how you do that. Fucking no, show me up. Like. All um, right, Aaron. Yeah. Do you want to tell me a story? Here goes. No. There was a farmer in Ulster. His name was Crundon, and he lived in a high up place in Ulster, far away from Owen Maka and the rest of the Crave Rua. He was not a fighting man, he was a man of the land. He loved his family and his wife until the day she died. He was heartbroken and now had three children to care for. But one day he came home from the fields and his children were already in bed and the dishes were being cleared from the table by a strikingly beautiful woman and there was a roaring fire in the hearth. Now the woman looked at him and told him to sit down and take off his boots and warm himself by the fire. So Crunden kind of went with it. He sat down, he warmed his bones he looked at this astonishingly beautiful woman and realised she was one of the she, one of those godlike people from the other world. But he did not want to make a mistake or step around, or miss, miss a step I should say. Instead he 
simply asked her her name. She said her name was Maka. Now this might have struck fear into his heart if he knew about the Morrigan, Maka and Bav, but he did not know those tales. Instead, he smiled and said it was a beautiful name. And this was the way they lived together then. She cared for him, he worked in the fields and she cared for their dwelling and their children. And Crundon was so happy in this time. He had the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She cooked for him and cared for his children. And when they went out hunting, he saw her running like no creature he'd ever seen before. She ran with such grace and such speed. It was faster than anything he'd ever seen, faster than the wind itself, and it took the breath out of his lungs just to watch her move so well. Time went by and her belly grew big with child, and his happiness grew as well. But an invitation came to their dwelling, an invitation to come to Owen Maka, to a great feast there by Crahor Macnassa, who the hosting, who was hosting. Now, Crondon was set to go on the eve of this feast, but Maka said not to mention her to anyone. And the look she gave him stilled his beating heart, and he knew he must do what was being told. No. Crundon went off to this feast, a little bit saddened that maybe Maka did not come with him so that he could show her off to all of the friends and allies and people gathered there, but this was not the way of it, and so he sat down to eat the choice meats and drink the fine wine and the meat that was going round as well, that honey liqueur, that thing that is so sweet you can barely take more than a sip is so strong and strong of alcohol indeed it is for it wasn't long that he became a little bit dizzy and when he heard a mention of the greatest cook in all of Ulster a man's wife sitting across from him being told she was the greatest cook in all of Ulster well Crundon felt absolutely astonished nearly wanting to correct the man because of course Maka was a better cook but he held himself, he realised, and remembered that Maka had warned him not to mention anything about her, so he swallowed this bit of information along with his pride and supped a little bit more on that sweet, sweet mead. So strong and sweet it was. Now, another mention, another boast from another man came saying that not only was this beautiful woman of his his wife was not only the most beautiful woman in Ulster but the most beautiful woman in all Ireland and once again Crundon he leapt to his feet and before he could actually correct the man and tell him that it was his wife Maka who was the most beautiful woman in the world he simply turned his gaze and looked out the window and saw a flock of geese flying overhead and took more of that sweet, delicious mead and drank it down. Now at this stage, Crundon was, well, he was bollocksed. Let's, let's not lie. He was very drunk. And he didn't give a flying fuck what he was going to say next. Because at this stage, he'd obliged his wife and he'd made sure he hadn't said anything about her. And he was eating and he was drinking and he wasn't really caring where his elbows were resting and he was just a bit more jovial and leaning into the table in that sort of way. And then the king, Crohor Macnassa, raised a glass and thanked everyone for coming. After all, he told the people there that the reason he wanted all of the people to be here with him was to raise this glass to the two horses he had just bought and purchased. The two horses were the fastest creatures in the land, he said. Now with this, Crundon called out, Ha! Not as, not as fast as my wife! Now, he didn't really say the words as the words just fell out of his face. And he realised it. He didn't really say that in his head at all. He'd said it quite loud and everyone had heard it. And everyone was shook. 
you cannot say anything against the king and you cannot correct him. Now with this, Crohor Magnassa stood and glared at Crondon. How dare you, he said. How dare you take this, these words and turn them on their head. You'll have to prove it. Now, everyone call out, where's your wife? How can you prove it? You'll have to race against the horses. Crondon, you fool, you're drunk. But now he had swords on his neck. And now Crohor Magnassa sent messengers to his house to get his wife to bring the Omaka so that she would race against his prize horses to prove how Grundon was wrong. Grundon begged and pleaded. And he, he said he was a mistake, he was wrong, he was drunk, it was a mistake, but he sobered up in those moments with those swords and that cold steel on his neck. But it wasn't long till Maka walked through the door and everyone's breath was sharply inhaled as they saw the fierce beauty of this woman everyone saw she was heavily pregnant. Now, Crohor pointed his stiff finger towards the racetrack, telling Maka that she would have to race his horses to prove the point her foolish husband had made. She begged and pleaded and looked around at all of the men in the hall there and asked them, Please, look in your heart. See that you've all come from women. Not to let this happen. To stand up for her. She just needed one man. But not a one of them looked in her eye. And all allowed it to go on. As Crondon fell silent and watched. His eyes weeping. Crohor yoked his chariot, his horses now neighing for the race. The racetrack led out, and Maka forced to stand next to these horses. Crohor looked at her and sized her up, smiling a vicious smile. But knowing there was something otherworldly about her, he grabbed the reins that bit tighter knowing he would have to press his horses hard to prove these were the fastest creatures in all Ireland. Maka looked around once more, not seeing a friendly face in any of the men that were gathered there. She felt the great bump on her belly, and she conceded she would have to race these horses. Now when they started, the horses galloped, the froth was coming out of their mouths and they ran so brilliantly and smoothly across the field and Crohor Magnassa was pulling and tugging at their reins to push them on because as he looked and strained his sight could see that Maka was running as swiftly over the grass, moving in a blurred vision right past them, her motion so easy her feet barely touching the grass as she flicked right past these men in such a vision of speed he had never seen before. And when she came to the end of that race, she beat them so easily that all of the men were shook and shocked. But she fell with blood running down between her legs and she cried out. Now taken by the pain of childbirth, she squeezed and she gave birth to two stillborn children. Her heart was broken, and the scowl that came on then shook every man's heart still, and she called to every one of them, You all come from a woman and yet you would not stand in front of me and defend me. And so she put a curse on them then. She 
he said, whenever the fighting men of Ulster need their strength the most, they will be struck down by the pains of a woman in childbirth for nine days and nine nights and lie sleeping for nine days after that. And this curse will last for nine generations. And it will strike any fighting man who is able to grow a beard on his chin. And with that, she vanished back to the other world. And Crondon and all of the men of Ulster were left to think what the curse of Maka would mean for them from that day out. Are we ever going to tell a story that doesn't end horribly? I mean, we're stuck on the tawn, so... <laughs> like, no, right? Like, well, not for a while. Four years ago, we started telling the tawn in live storytelling sessions. And <sighs> people just kept on coming and asking for more sad shit. Irish yeah. people demand it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying is it's your fault. No, what we're saying is <laughs> it's our culture's fault. It's our culture's fault. <laughs> we just we like our... maudlin' sad stories. It's our sad, gloomy culture's fault. Yeah, sorry about that, Liz. Yeah. We, we do have a few happy ones, like... Yeah. Eventually, I think. No, all of the ones that... Yeah, no. There's a few. There's a few. Right, yeah, there is, yeah. There's a load, there's a load that are great crack. This one was maybe not... It wasn't the worst, though, like, isn't it? It started off very cheery. It did. It starts off nicely. I like I like how it kind of gets, you know, the strangeness of the, the people of the other world, where, you know, Maka just, like rocks up to this guy's house and cleans it and puts the kids to bed and then when Crunden comes in she's like you're my husband now and he's like right grand sort thank <laughs> fuck for that I love that he's just like yeah he's like oh man I was not coping <laughs> <laughs> oh man what was I doing without a woman in my life I was fuck like uh, yeah I, and it is kind of it is really weird well it again it shows the difference between like you said the people of the other world and the people of yeah know. the kind of Celtic people well that's that's an interesting thing and we will talk more about this you know the next cycle we're going to look at probably after the Ulster cycle is, is this whole book of invasions and the different the peoples Gawala, in Ireland yeah absolutely which is a, again a mental story and, and a lot of fun um, and occasionally there are plagues and everybody dies but you know wish to stop spoiling <laughs> Let's talk, let's talk about this story. Because let's talk about this story. Well, yeah, the only reason I mentioned that was it was to kind of get in this idea of there are there are other peoples in Ireland, and the interesting mm. thing about it is that yeah. even if they go away, they never really quite go away. You know, the things that they did still matter, yeah. and the two of the Dan particularly had this you know reaction to the Celts who arrived as the sons of Mill, and they kind of said, right, we're. Um, we they lose the deciding battle over who will reign and they say right we're not going to uh, stay under anybody else's rule we are going to go and just like live in a slightly parallel other world that's kind of supernatural but also still kind of here mm. and uh, the old John Moriarty's quote always comes to my mind you know when you start talking about peoples who've come here who had an exchange with the land who've lived here yeah you know the land remembers the land retains and if you walk through places Moriarty says you might just feel a bit of sadness come on you and all of a sudden you're just, you you take something that's been given to you from another source but you're not quite sure where that came from yeah it's been retained in the land so um absolutely yeah and and that's that's a I, l- I like that there's that sense of presence in the Irish landscape in a lot of these old stories. And, you know, we have in in this story uh, a real location of Awen Maka. Navin Fort. Yeah, and still the there. King Crahur Macnasa. So he's an early king at this stage, right? He's, yeah, I mean, the timelines are always a bit of a mindfuck in these stories. But yeah, he's not like, this is not long into his kingship. This is sort of around the same time as the Deirdre you know initial decision <laughs> like you know? I, I like how we've done this podcast as well kind of accidentally slash on purpose we've done it in our ways in a way like <laughs> I know the chron- chronology of myth is a bit mad Do you know anyway. what we're just, we're just <laughs> getting everyone used to the fact that this, like if you like chronology 
You should not listen to us. Because <laughs> <laughs> we told the Thorn, then we told the backstory of Deirdre, and now we're telling yeah. the first backstory and, of Mark. And now we're telling a different. And you know what? <laughs> At a later date, we might even tell you how everyone was born, which ah, is a yeah. further backstory. Very true, yeah. They're really um, great stories as well. So, okay, going back to the king, though, King Grown McNassa, he's, you know, there's a story of how he gets the kingship off Fergus McRoy. And, you know, we'll say for argument's sake, he's, he's an early king. He's yeah. kind of getting used to his kingship here. He throws a feast. He thinks it's going to be a great idea. What is it about, like, him making that point that's such a big deal? What is it about Crunden yeah. kind of going against it's, his opinion that makes it, like, such a not an okay thing to do? It's not just going against his opinion. Like, this is, um, he is, as you say, a young king. He's also probably at this age at this stage kind of in his teens because he's very very young when he gets the kingship like he's he's explicitly he's, too young he's a kid like yeah like he's 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 not he's too young yes what, kind of, his what, mother kind of rules it doesn't whatever he? whatever the the line was at which you were mature enough to be a king he has not met it do you know yeah, what i mean right, and we don't right. exactly know where that is so like he's young and presumably a bit hot-headed at this stage and there is this thing with the characterization of Krahor where his pride is always his downfall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this was not coming out of nowhere. This was a culture in which your status was incredibly important. And, you know, the way people treated you and the deference they gave you indicated your status. And if you allowed someone to insult you, it was kind of like you were agreeing with them in their, you know, giving you a lower status than you actually had. Respect my authority! Comes to mind. I mean... <laughs> Sorry. You I know. saw you grinning and I knew you were going to just be <laughs> terrible. And there it was. was. Terrible. Um, but like, yeah, like, it, he's... There's a, there's a kind of a logic behind it from his point of view in that, like, he cannot... He cannot let himself be shown up like this. He's gathered everyone in Ulster mm-hmm. to be like, Look at my, you know, cool basically horses. a new sports car, like my cool horses. It's mm-hmm. it's the equivalent of buying like a really pimped out car or something like that. And and this dude stands up and goes, mine's better. Like. But why does he have to prove the point to the point of, of Crunden either dying or, you know, forcing a pregnant woman to race him? Like, what, like what's that about? Why is it like, it's more important to show that I'm right than to show that someone can defy me? Absolutely. I mean, then, then we get back to this idea of like, you know, mythology as a, as a working out of something psychological. And we talked about this a bit as well in the mm. first uh, first or second podcast. I can't remember which now. The This idea of like constant escalation, you know, the, the folly of not backing down when you're clearly in the wrong. Mm. And I think there's something of that. Go, there's something of the same kind of idea happening here where, yes, he has a certain amount at stake in terms of reputation. It would probably look odd if he had let that go initially, but it's really not okay what he does to Maka as a woman who's pregnant. Like, there's no suggestion here that like any of the Ulster men are being reasonable in this. They all shy away from it, don't they? They are. They're all like, "I'm not dealing with that. No, not put my head well, in the line." They they don't stand up for her, which is the issue. Which is the issue with, and that's why her her curse is so. I, I always think you find this in kind of mythological goddesses. They're very surgical in their revenge. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're ve- it's very directed. And it's very directed in this case as well. She's taking their... Because they don't use their strength to defend someone who needs defending. She's like, right. Fuck yes. You're not having it then. So you mentioned the Morrigan as well. Now, that's... Did I mention that or did you mention that? You mentioned Maka, sorry. Yes. And in the story I mentioned the fact that the Morrigan has a triple aspect to her or Mm. has sisters, I'm not sure which it was. Maka. Nobody is. I'm not sure. There was the Morrigan, Maka, Bov or Bov and that was the Marignu. Marignu? The, the mm-hmm. Marignus. So there's there's a couple of theories about this. And yeah. uh, tell me more about that. Out of out of you know out of interest. Again, this is the kind of thing where there isn't a right or wrong answer to this. There are a lot of different opinions. So there's a there's a, a war goddess, uh, possibly, who is called the Morrigan, 
uh, the the is important. Sellers. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she's she's the Morrigan, you know, she's the only one. But there is also uh, there are two other goddesses, and these are Maka and Bove that are also have a heavy association with war, and are they had they're supposed to have had the same mother. So there's a question about whether they are, you know, three sisters or maybe three aspects of the same goddess. There's a lot of tripling in Irish myth, which some of you might have noticed already. We had a bit of it last time with Nisha and his two brothers. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a lot of this kind of like uh, this tripling effect. And actually, interestingly enough, Maka on her own, there's three of them. So the the Maka of of this story is actually the third of three Makas. There's also a warrior queen Maka who uh, traces out the shape of Awan Maka with her brooch. And there is, and that's why it's called uh, Awan Maka. There's the story that we heard before, which in which uh, Awan Maka is translated as the twins of Maka. Yeah. And that race is the reason that it's called Awan Maka. Which makes no sense if, you, if they were all in place Awan Maka. I mean, but listen, tell me why we're, me. Not here, we're not here for sense. We're here for myth. Yeah. And then, and, and the, then the, the original Maka, the first Maka was the wife of Nemed. And uh, Arma and Awan Maka are both named after her. Arma. Ard Maka, the high place of Maka. Uh, is what that county translates as. That's a place in Ireland for anyone who's listening who's not from Ireland. That's mad. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole fascinating folklore and etymology of place names that uh, oh. is a whole like basically Google Maps folklore project that I will I will do on one of the years. Yeah, you know, it'll be on our Patreon page as a goal. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, give Surrogate a year where she doesn't have to do anything else and yeah, she'll get this done. That's I won't let you do that. Yeah, um, that that's unrealistic. So, if Maka is one of the aspects of the Morrigan, let's for argument's sake say she is. Sure. She she kind of crops up mysteriously. She kind of gives Crundon a bit of an ill omen. Don't mention me. And of course, he's gonna fucking do it. He, he can barely <laughs> keep his tongue in his mouth as all of them, everyone's boasting about their great wives and their great whatever it is. Ah uh, no, like, <laughs> that's the, you know we we joined dots, but like you know, but at, at the same time, he he's told specifically whether or not it was a poetic license on our our part or not. He was given specific direction oh, not yeah. to mention it, mean, and therefore I think the reason we put that in is because this is this was a boastful culture in a way that kind of modern I- Ireland isn't. Hmm. So it would have been an expected thing for him to kind of brag about his wife and his stuff, and yeah. you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in a, in a sense of like, you can see that ending coming. Does she maybe set him up a little bit? Um, I think that's a bit of a metatextual way of looking at. It. I don't think I don't think from the st- from, from from the inside of that story, I, I I'm not sure about that interpretation. But it's, Fair it's possible because the because Mar- the Morrigan like she crops up over this story again and again and again. She does. She really does, and she's she's very much uh, present in the background of this. Which I think is, you know, we've done comparison to our tellings of um, the Tawn alongside the Iliad and oh, yeah. pulled out some of the similarities and contrasts there. And that's one of the huge contrasts is the the interventions by the gods of the Greeks are very, <laughs> very fire and fury, like you wouldn't miss them. But the, the two of the Danon, um operate in a totally different way. Subtle they're, merges their little. Yeah, they're very subtle. They maybe Maybe that wasn't them. Um, yeah. They're kind they're of dream, they appear in dreams or they give prophecies. They yeah, you know. and they turn up in the forest and you don't know who they are. Yeah. And you know they turn into crows and then they're gone. Or they <laughs> they walk through in a mist and no one can see them. And there's all this kind of like, are they or aren't they? You know what I mean? They're, yeah, they're, they're yeah. much more ambiguous. It's that kind of shadow at night. Did you turn around and was there someone standing there? Or was <laughs> there? Fu- yeah, there was. It was a Tuatha Dé Um Fun fact on Tuatha Dé Danann. Now this is something that um, Caitlin. Uh, passed over to us. Yeah. Uh, a fan of Candid Tales, she, she's offered me a big book to read. And I found this out recently, and this is kind of mind blowing. The Tua de Danon translates as the people of the goddess Danu. And I've been asking countless number of people, who the fuck is Danu? Right? Nobody knows. They named the Danube <clears throat> after her and then forgot her forever. This is, there's a huge amount of like really partial evidence that there was this massive goddess in Europe. 
called Anu or Danu. She was huge, like, just like, looking massive was, feet, tree trunk thighs. That's not what I meant. She was <laughs> massive. Like. But actually, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Because all of the stories of her have been lost. And I don't think they have been lost. I think they were they were Written deliberately out. suppressed and, and, uh, and erased. The so patriarchy the patriarchy doing its Well, like, there. you know, it was, it was a massive edit job. But, it, you know, the, the only surviving traces of Anu are there. There's a couple of Anus that crop up as kind of witches. Mm-hmm. In various different parts, and and the 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 name of the Tua De Danan, the people of the goddess, and and so what I read recently was back in nine hundred BC between nine hundred and and twelve hundred is the first ever mention of unrecorded mention of BC uh, or AD. Oh, AD, like the one after. Yes, yeah. <laughs> before AD, yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah, my bad. See, <laughs> not an expert, lads. Anyway, read this thing I in a book. I think it's called CE these days, though. Is it? Yeah. Well, it was all about your anyway, man on the cross. Anyway, CE. Um, anyway, between the year nine hundred and twelve hundred, uh, then when they start from when they started counting, um, <laughs> you know, there was time before that. That was the first time that they, they were ever referred to as the two of the Danan. Before that, ah. they were only ever called the Fear Day, the God People. Right? Oh, interesting. So the God People, and that's what they were. They were godlike people. They were. So they were similar. They were, you know, they walked around. They had flaws. They were people. They killed each other. They fought, but they were also magic, and they shape shifted, and they were, became crows and did all kinds of mad stuff. All the rest of it. And then when Ireland became Catholic, the well, Christian, Christian initially before yeah. before they divided into Catholic and Protestant. All right, that's what the difference is. <laughs> News to you too, some yeah, of you who are yeah. listening right now. Uh, I learn stuff all the time when it I'm talking was, to her. It was this whole big thing. We don't anyway, need to go into that. <laughs> Jerusalemites come over and they're called the people the, of God. The Israelites? Should, Israelites, Jesus. I'm having a mare here, lads. Um, anyway. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to summarise that. So, before 900 yeah. CE, what we now think of as the two of the Dan yeah. were actually referred to as the fair day, the God men, or yeah. the people of God. Yeah. Right? Then Christianity came with the stories of the Israelites. <laughs> Israelites, and not Jerusalemites. It's a different thing. Finish the thought. And they were the chosen people of God, right? Which translates into Irish as the fair day. day. So, so they changed So they had to change it. it. They had to make a difference. They had to make some form of separation Do between them. They make them the people of the goddess to put them down because they yeah. were big old Christian patriarchs. That's exactly oh. what they did. So they became the two day Danin only after Catholicism came here. So they, they kind of demoted the God people, the fear day, and they said they're the people of, the, of that goddess. But what you really want to be doing well, is... What raising, they didn't raising, know raising. was that that was not a demotion, because fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, like if you're a Christian and you have loads of money and you want to support some Patreon, do that too. <laughs> Aaron, you're such a hero. <laughs> <laughs> right, that probably didn't work at all. But anyway, that's probably uh, the end of this podcast, because we went well, off on lots we of went tangents. off on a little bit of a tangent. Uh, yes, we certainly went off on a little bit of a tangent. But I think that's, you know, our tangents are interesting. Uh, actually, we think our tangents are interesting. <laughs> we could listen to this crack all day. We basically are only doing this because people put a recorder in front of us now after many years of us doing this anyway. Uh, but we need you to let us know if this is actually as interesting as we think it is. Yeah, call out for less waffle, more stories, uh, more facts, more uh, research, more... You know, if you ha- if you know stuff yourselves, have at you. Let, you know, get on in here and, and tell us about it. Yeah, so, let um, us know, right into us. us. You can find us. www.candletales.ie you can hashtag on your social media. Hashtag Candle Tales Podcast. Yeah, hey. Uh, you can go to Patreon. Yeah, that is page. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> I think it's, it's patreon.com forward slash Candle Tales. Google us. We, we were in a good rhythm there. <laughs> we were in a real good rhythm and you oh, messed dropped it up. I oh, dropped the ball there. Uh, Sorry. You can find us on Patreon and you can lend us your support. You can also support the podcast by sharing it with all of your friends. Yeah, just and be sound like. if there's any, you know, leave us a review, share it around, tell people about it. Uh, particularly your, your like wealthy friends. Do you know? All right, we've hit that in the head now at this we, stage. We have, yeah. Um, we don't have any money. We, like, we're, we're broke. So listen, lads, thanks for listening. It's been lovely sharing this story with you. This is a new attempt for us to share these stories. So we're getting used to it uh, with this recorder instead of a live audience. We keep on doing our live shows. Catch us if you can. And until then, keep her lit. And a big thank you to Oshin for uh, editing this podcast. Oh, yeah, and for playing Ryan. the music.
Oshin Ryan. Ryan. You legend. Thanks, buddy. You.